Welcome to Ancestral Health Today, evolutionary insights into modern health. Welcome everyone to today's episode of Ancestral Health Today. Thank you for being with us. I am your host, Isabel Burnett, and today I am doing a solo episode. I am a board certified health coach and also an autoimmune protocol certified coach. I'm doing an episode today because I wanted to speak about the intersection of chronic conditions and health optimization within the framework of ancestral health and evolutionary medicine. First, I'm going to go a little bit into my history because this has a very personal um, framework for me. And I will put in the show notes uh, when you can um, skip that history if you want to go straight into the actual content. So a little bit about myself. I was born in the Dominican Republic and I got uh, shingles at the age of seven and subsequently developed a condition called MECFS, which is myalgic encephalomyelitis and chronic fatigue syndrome, which at that time was undiagnosed. But looking back, I had all of the symptoms. My diagnosis came way, way later at the age of 25, um, somewhere around there. So how do I know that I had this condition growing up? Well, I knew that I wasn't the same as my peers. Um, I didn't have the same stamina. I didn't have the same amount of energy. Every time I tried to do something that my peers would do, I would pay for it for days, weeks, and sometimes even months, whether that was playing basketball at school or going for a long walk to visit a friend um, and just doing things that everybody would do um, on a normal basis. I also experienced pain as a child, although the pain was not as significant at this stage as the fatigue was. There were food intolerances. Um, the only pain that was consistent was leg pain. The leg pain would also come as a consequence of doing exertion, such as a long walk or trying to ride the bike or things of that nature. And I would have to um, be in bed for hours with the with the leg pain. Um, I would be given medication, massage, and other interventions in order to relieve the the pain, which is excruciating. But fortunately, that wasn't an everyday thing. It was um, it was occasionally. So fast forward to the age of twelve. At the age of 12, I got measles and I was very sick for about a month. I was hospitalized. Um, and then when I came home from the hospital, um, there was this one time when I was on my bed and uh, my voice would just simply not come out and I needed water. Um, I was starting to feel dizzy, but I got up and fell down the stairs. And after that is when the pain that was a constant or that has been a constant in my life really started. Um, there was a lot of neck pain. There was a lot of back pain, hips, um, you name it, muscle soreness, everything, which at the age of 12 is very, very difficult to understand. Um, I was taken to a lot of doctors and there was really no explanation um, for what I was going through. And um, I was just given, you know, comfort measures, medication from time to time and things of that nature. I grew up with my grandmother who was um, very knowledgeable about herbal medicine and uh, supplementation. So she did everything that she could in order to alleviate that in other ways also provide comfort and hopefully fill some nutritional gaps. Um, it's, uh, it's worth saying that 
eating junk food and things of that nature was not a factor. It was not an issue uh, for me growing up. The diet that we had growing up was extremely healthy and um, there were still food intolerances that happened during this time, although not as, as uh, severe as they went on to be later on. Then um, something very interesting that's very relevant to, to the story that happened after I had the measles and everything got worse was that I would get throat infections from time to time that were severe and also very painful. And we had a local doctor who would give me Rocephin injections. And I almost looked forward to getting the, the uh, tonsillitis because I knew that after getting the antibiotics, I would feel much better than my normal levels um, for weeks and sometimes for months. And then as time went by, the need for those antibiotics decreased. And by the time I went to college, um, it was a it wasn't as significant as it had been for the past four years. Um, I wanted to go to college to be a doctor, but every time I went to visit a cadaver lab, um, I would pass out or nearly passed out. And I didn't know why. Now I understand why and, and how that is part of my condition and um, the activity of mast cells and so forth and so on. But back then, I just thought that I just wasn't built to be a doctor because if I couldn't even go into the cadaver lab, then I wouldn't be able to do the required work in, in a hospital. Um, I do have uh, hyperosmia, which is more severe, the worst I feel. Um, and that also played a significant part. So I went into engineering instead. And getting through college was extremely difficult, but I had a really, really great support system between my family and my friends in school who would carry me down from the third floor when my leg pain flare up, um, would give me massages and um, kind of uh, uh, set me straight in terms of my structure um, before in between classes. So that was what allowed me to uh, really get through that. Um, after that, I got married and had my first child. And my pregnancy was incredibly difficult. I had to spend it in bed the majority of the time. I had nausea and vomiting um, up until the day I gave birth. And um, again, mystery as to why. A pregnancy is is so difficult, but also not a big of a mystery in terms of how I had been um, prior to those four years when I had some improvement. So fast forward, and um, my husband is from the United States. He grew up in Rhode Island. So after my son was about a year old, we moved to the U.S., and um, I had somewhat gone back to my pre-pregnancy baseline in terms of how I was feeling. So definitely excessive fatigue compared to, you know, healthy people, um, pain and, and whatnot, but not to a level where I couldn't function. Um, but upon moving to the U.S., things deteriorated rather quickly. I was able to um, have a couple of months where that wasn't the case. But after that, um, I had multiple infections and it got to a level where going to work, I had to pull over several times in a random parking lot and take, you know, five to 10 minute naps in order to be able to continue. Um, I was later diagnosed with narcolepsy, which is another um, potentially post-infectious condition that um, affects quality of life significantly. Um, so 
things deteriorated for me. Um, I, I felt like hell all the time. There is really no other explanation for that. And after that, I went into years of a roller coaster of feeling absolutely terrible, not being able to work, um, and then being home, being able to do a lot of things to improve myself, including resting, and then being able to go back to work and you know try to do it all over again. And that roller coaster lasted for a lot of years. And of course, it um, it impacted severely my ability to mother my children, my relationships. Um, everything that, you know, we have to do in life is affected by chronic illness. Um, I was diagnosed with ME-CFS in around 1998. I was very fortunate to find a doctor that understood this condition and had some knowledge about it and was empathetic, didn't dismiss my symptoms because when you look at me, um, now or ever, I don't look sick. There's no indication that anything is going on in my body. My levels of fatigues are not shown on my face. And fatigue it, in itself is a very inadequate word to describe what we go through. So I was diagnosed, but that diagnosis at that time really didn't mean much because what we were told is there's really nothing that we can do. We can give you pain medication, muscle relaxers, um, and again, comfort measures, which um, I had bad reactions to a lot of the things that I tried. But that's what set me on the road of really trying to understand and more than understand, experiment with the things that I could do in order to get at least some relief that wasn't necessarily medication related. Um, I was successful at times for you know short periods, but there were pieces of this puzzle that were missing that I didn't yet understand um, that have had a big impact on um, on what I'm able to do, my level of function, and therefore my quality of life. So fast forward to 2015, I had had great improvement in 2010. Um, and then I fell and I started having headaches that were constant. And when I mean constant, I mean constant. I don't mean that they are very frequent. I mean that they are constant, do not go away. At times they intensified and it felt like more like a migraine where you can't stand light and have to be in bed. And other times it was a lower level of pain where you can do certain things, but it's definitely um, a big task to get anything done when you have that um, lower level headache that is in the back of my head. So at this point, I was able to be diagnosed with Chiari malformation, craniocervical instability, um, and hypermobile EDS. So the craniocervical instability stems for, from the hypermobility, and now we understand that there's a big overlap with um, MECFS and hypermobility. And now we also understand that we have that overlap with long COVID and hypermobility. In fact, there's an article that was published recently um, that explained that people with hypermobility are at a higher risk of uh, getting long COVID. So with those diagnoses in hand, and also after that, I was, was when I was finally diagnosed with narcolepsy, um, I was able to put the pieces of the puzzle together and explore more adequate treatments, as well as better understand myself, what I could do 
to sustain improvements that I had, but also what brought those improvements down and why. So why did I just give you all that history? I'm giving you that history because my story is unfortunately not unique. And the development of these conditions can happen at any age. It happened, unfortunately, very early for me, but it's very common for it to happen um, in your 20s, in your 30s. And it there doesn't seem to be a, um, a reason um, that is obvious uh, to us. So in terms of who can develop these conditions, um, we see people who are formerly athletes, we see people who are generally very healthy, we see people who have other various conditions. Um, so the mix is really, really big. And in the last four years, we have seen an explosion of this with long COVID. Uh, patients with long COVID, 50% of them meet the criteria for MECFS and others um, who don't meet the criteria have some of those elements and um, other issues that are also complex and chronic that affect the quality of life and um, affect their function. And we need to really understand this and the intersection of complex chronic illnesses and health optimization in the context of ancestral health and evolutionary medicine. So we can better communicate with each other, so we can better serve people if we are in a coaching position and um, that we can also understand what risk we are at, whether we have um, an incredible level of, of health or um, we have other factors um, already going into it. Um, so with long COVID, we all know that the last four years um, have affected people, not just with the acute um, infection, which many people have a very mild um, level of acute infection. That's why a lot of people refer to it as just another flu. But the just another flu in terms of the acute infection is an accurate picture, but in terms of the long-term consequences is incredibly inadequate. And the reason why it is inadequate is because People go on to develop long COVID. People go on to um, lose their function, lose their jobs because of this. And it is um, something that needs to be acknowledged, understood, and, and also addressed. What happens with um, long COVID is that one, it is the risk goes up with each infection that you have. And um, I will put the references in the show notes for this as well. And people with hypermobility, which may not be diagnosed because it may not be a symptomatic um, hypermobility, people are also at higher risk of developing long COVID. And then there's another series of, of factors that are quote unquote, dormant that have an effect on uh, the development of long COVID. These are not the only complex conditions that require a lot of nuance when discussing recovery and interventions and treatment. There are others as well, but for the purpose of this, um, I'll continue to focus on um, this too. So where do we intersect? There's anecdotally, of course, there, there is a lot of um, discussion in the ancestral health uh, movement about lifestyle in general, but a big focus on diet and exercise, um, which stems from the fact that we have, or we live rather in an era of overprocessed food, um, and that is very different than how our ancestors, whether immediate ancestors at this point or um, ancestors long time ago, 
lived their lives, right? Food was not the commodity that it is considered today. Food was nourishment. Food was a way of sharing our lives every day. Um, and in a lot of cases, food procurement was part of the lifestyle of our ancestors. And in that procurement, you have built-in movement and um, you know what we call exercise today, which is a prescriptive um, amount of movement for a, a period of time. Movement in general encompasses so much more than that and happens at the macro and the micro level. Um, but we know that these are things that our ancestors um, enjoyed and that has decreased more and more over time. And with that decrease, we have seen an increase in uh, chronic conditions. So we need to have nuanced discussions about how those things intersect, how they are affected, how, they, how it affects us, and what are the differences in our approaches when we come to this from a an already um, in a body that already has a complex chronic conditions, or we come to this from the perspective of wanting to optimize where we are at. Um, we all live in the modern world and we all have to deal with the consequences that this has brought into our health and um, the modifications in our lifestyle that occur as a result of that. But we all need to deal with that in a very different way based on the processes that have already taken place in our bodies, um, our genetics, our predispositions, and um, very importantly, the resources that we have to work with. We know that sleep is incredibly important, yet the disturbances in sleep that are not just repaired or um, improved with sleep hygiene um, are a big factor in chronic illnesses um, and in, in infection-associated chronic conditions like long COVID and ME-CFS. Um, they are a, a big point of, um, a, or a big source rather, of uh, further issues and deterioration, um, but the way to correct those and the way to improve that doesn't come from just sleep hygiene. And again, the conversation is incredibly nuanced and that's what we, we need to all understand whether we are trying to improve our own outcomes and continue to get frustrated that we're not seeing the results that we want to see, even though we are putting in the work, um, or whether you are in a um, coach or even a peer capacity and you're having these discussions with someone else who is having these struggles. And um, it's helpful to have the ability to understand that it's not all the same. So as a healthy individual, you may come to the world of ancestral health and gain an understanding about the impact of the modern world. You may be someone who is getting into your 40s or um, you're working a lot of hours, um, you're not sleeping well, um, you're not eating the best that you know you can and you're starting to have some consequences, maybe some aches and pains, maybe, um, again, you're sleeping uh, too few hours or you're having difficulty falling asleep because um, the stress that you're going through, or maybe um, you're somebody who has gained some weight and you want to be able to have more energy, and be able to do the things that you used to do in the past. So those are all very valid reasons and um, varied reasons why people, you know, discover ancestral health and start to understand that we have lost the connection 
with um, with our food, with nature, with um, each other, you know, the relationship with with community that used to exist uh, because we live in very uh, separate, very individualistic um, units. And um, it is a, a big burden to have to do everything on your own. There's limited time and there's limited energy, even for the healthiest of us. So um, people come with that understanding and try to implement the available lifestyle changes that are used to align more with the way that our ancestors um, used to live life, right? So whether that is improving your exercise, um, by going hiking or um, by even doing runs or long walks or training or things of that nature that utilize the muscles and, and, and mimic the activities that our ancestors used to do um, because they needed to do it, whether that was for food procurement or that was um, to move from one landscape to another, um, or to build their own houses, all of those things were built into the fabric of society um, in, in the small societies that used to exist. So, and that's something that we don't have um, anymore that is readily available to us. We have to construct it. We have to um, make it happen in order to, as we say, have our environment better match our biological needs. Um, we need sleep and we have lights going on 24 hours a day, which affect the signals that our body gets and affect our circadian rhythm. Um, we have to take care of uh, maybe aging parents or children. And that takes a lot of time and a lot of effort and a lot of energy and it draws away from the things that we may want to do in order to take care of our own bodies. So when we come to ancestral health from that perspective, we start to understand that process and we start to understand how we can make modifications to better align our lifestyles with the things that we need biologically, the things that our ancestors were able to do naturally. And with that, um, the majority of us have have seen an improvement, right? Um, and if you're coming from, from that perspective, the perception is that all that it takes is some discipline and some adjustments and some integration of certain things in order to be able to achieve that lifestyle and therefore achieve that outcome, which is what we all want, better health. Um, the, the problem with that is that one, not everybody has access to the same resources, right? Not everybody is able to buy a chili pad and be able to have colder temperatures at night and even if you are, um, even if you have those resources, a lot of the times, you know, you may live with a partner or other family members where there is friction in uh, being able to do some of the things that uh, that you want to do, whether it is in the preparation of the food or, um, you know, the, the going hiking or, or things of that nature. So there's a lot of points of friction at, um, in, in this transition in wanting to adopt an ancestral lifestyle and be able to um, improve your health uh, in this way. But the friction is greater and greater um, for certain people because of different factors, whether that is resources or as we are talking about in this intersection, that is due to somebody having a complex chronic illness where the factors are not just going to be having discipline and being able to modify your environment in a certain way. There are a lot of complex issues that go into, um, that, that have to be taken into account 
And that we also have to understand that even with the integration of all of the modifications and the lifestyle changes and living as close as one possibly can to an ancestrally inspired lifestyle, that is still not a solution for a lot of people. And there's there's this perspective that if you are not getting better is because you're not doing enough, which is a very inaccurate, but also a very harmful perspective and one that further separates us from each other, that further contributes to a divide that exists that doesn't allow for a very important aspect of ancestral health, and that is community. That is being able to rely on each other, being able to understand each other, being able to share in each other's burdens and triumphs, um, and being able to coexist together in a manner that is beneficial for everyone involved. So what makes the difference between somebody who is coming to the ancestral health world and using this framework to improve their health and ultimately optimize it, but may not have any quote unquote major issues um, affecting them at the moment, and someone who is coming into the ancestral health world looking at um, the factors that compose this framework and how our ancestors live and want to also be able to implement um, what we have to offer in order to improve their condition, but they come from a complex chronic condition where no amount of discipline necessarily is going to have a big impact into the disease um, development, the symptoms, the level of function, et cetera. Um, the difference is big and we need to acknowledge that. So I'll start with the factors that affect MECFS and as I said before, now long COVID and 50% of long COVID sufferers meet the criteria for MECFS. One of the big um, hallmarks of MECFS is post-exertional malaise. Um, if you hear me talking elsewhere, you'll understand that I have big qualms with a lot of the terminology that is used um, scientifically and the naming conventions that are used um, when um, explaining the symptoms or naming these conditions, because the names end up being very inadequate and end up being um, misinterpreted by people who are outside of the scientific community. So the public at large ends up not understanding the reality of the symptoms and the lack of function that these conditions bring. So for example, um, fatigue, right? Conic fatigue syndrome, the level of um, fatigue, if you will, the description using the word fatigue is very, very inadequate. Why? Because everybody experiences fatigue, right? You have a long day at work, you exercised in a way that you haven't exercised before, you had um, too much activity with the kids over the weekend, and then you have to go to work on Monday and you're fatigued, right? Everybody experiences that. The level of fatigue that is experienced in MECFS and, and it's shared with some other conditions as well, but this is a primary, um, it's a primary indicator is it's not fatigue where you can push through. It's not fatigue where you can rest a little bit and overcome it. It is a level of fatigue that feels like your muscles are emptied. 
It feels like you have a battery inside of you and it doesn't matter how long you charge it. It just does not charge. It is a, a level of fatigue that keeps you sometimes from getting up from your bed and being able to go to the bathroom. And if you do, you pay for it um, by that getting even worse and by exacerbating other symptoms, which is what I was going to say before, post-exertional malaise. Post-exertional malaise is also not very descriptive because the word malaise is something that everybody feels when you're starting to get a cold, when you're starting to get the flu, um, when you have even some indigestion, you feel a certain level of malaise, right? But the post-exertional malaise that is felt in these complex conditions is very disproportionate to the amount of exertion that happened. There is a spectrum and we call people anywhere from mild to very severe. And again, the word mild is inappropriate because even though the function of the person may be close to or equal to that of a healthy person, that level of function does not exist without an incredible amount of symptoms which are not always coupled. So the complexity of the conditions and the complexity of the, um, the naming conventions and how that does not match the reality of the conditions are things that are generally not well known and not understood. So there's been stigma um, associated with MECFS for a long time and now with, with long COVID. And that stigma very often um, shows itself as not being believed or people simply thinking that um, you're not trying hard enough, that um, it must be nice to be able to stay in bed all day or not to leave your house and things of that nature, which if you think about it, if you think about it, you know, deeply is, is just preposterous because, you know, who wants to lose their income? Um, and if you understand how difficult it is to get disability and how low those wages are, or not wages, but that, that income is, um, you understand that really choice is not a factor in here. So, but I digress. Let's go back to um, post-exertional malaise. Post-exertional malaise is the symptoms and lack of function, the consequences that happen after a particular um, activity. And those con that the consequences are very disproportionate to the activity. And that those consequences depend on the level of severity that the person is at. So someone who is severe, who is um, bed bound or house bound is going to have those consequences from activities that are daily activities of life. So going to the bathroom, going to the kitchen, um, you know, brushing their teeth, having to speak to someone else for, um, you know, more than a few minutes and so forth and so on. Someone who is moderate may see those consequences with, um, you know, going to doctor's appointment. Uh, someone may be able to work part-time, but the rest of the time they have to spend it recuperating from doing that work because of the post-exertional malaise. And someone who is at the um, mild end of the range may be able to have a full-time job and have many of the activities that, or the function level that other people do have, but um, again, with a an incredible amount of symptoms attached to that, and also knowing that at any moment, um, that can change either because of an infection or because you exceeded that envelope of um, energy that your body is able to generate. And the difficult part is that 
that level of energy is also variable within the same person um, for reasons that we don't, we're not always aware of and that we can all, not always detect or predict. So for somebody with a chronic condition that has a higher level of function, go in, let's say for a mile walk, um, it's within their energy envelope and they do that whether it is consistent or occasionally, but that energy envelope can change for multiple factors, for multiple reasons. And all of a sudden, someone's um, mile walk has detrimental effects and causes post-exertional malaise because that energy envelope narrowed. And um, it could be that that was spent in other activities and we are not realizing how much of those activities are utilizing that energy. Or it could simply be because someone had a recent infection that set them back or something that um, we need to have nuanced conversations and acknowledge too is maybe because a vaccine um, you know, set somebody back, which happens. And um, we do see reactions from vaccines that are uh, detrimental and, and either have the onset of these conditions or have made people with these conditions um, worse. We've seen the opposite too, which is really paradoxical. Um, but we do know that the effect on the immune system, whether it is from a virus or the vaccine, um, can have an effect in the disease process. So while it is um, poorly understood, it is not um, it is not unacknowledged that this also happens and that we need to be able to have the conversations between what are the risks and what are the benefits and who is at more risk than another person to have those effects from a vaccine rather than um you know from the virus itself we do see it we do, do see the development of long covid at much greater rates resulting from the um, the virus itself than the vaccine, but we also see it in the vaccine and that has been coined as long vax. And, you know, it is something that we need to be able to discuss in order to be able to research it and someone doesn't get labeled at, and as anti-vax because of, um, you know, because they're acknowledging this fact and People are able to have these discussions and express this and um, acknowledge the benefits of vaccines while also acknowledging the risks of it. But I'm digressing from uh, the topic at hand. Uh, what I wanted to discuss in this portion was we went into the approach from a person who comes to ancestral health in modifying and aligning that lifestyle with our ancestors or as close to it as we can possibly do in the modern world, right? But uh, what is the difference when somebody already has the process of a chronic and complex chronic conditions? Um, the premise is that we can all benefit from having a lifestyle that is um, biologically compatible with our needs, right? That we are not affecting our circadian rhythm by being blasted by lights all day, that we are able to maintain the tensile strength of our connective tissue um, with movement, um, that we are able to um, do the things that maintain that health and improve that health based on where we're at. But that approach is incredibly different when we are dealing with complex chronic illnesses and 
the the best example is post-exertional malaise, right? So we know from data that exercise is beneficial for many aspects of health. But if you have a condition where exercise is detrimental, we need to take that into account. How is it detrimental? If you exceed that energy envelope, which is very small for many, many people, even those with high function in terms of exercise, then you are setting back the function of that person, which is counterproductive and harmful, and in many instances have landed people in uh, worse permanent or long-term condition than they were prior to um, exercising, right? So in long COVID, for example, anecdotally, there are so many athletes um, and so many people who value exercise who have said, I got over the infection, the acute infection, and I didn't feel well for months afterwards. It was difficult to do what I needed to do, but I, my understanding is that exercise, you know, is beneficial. So I wanted to continue to do it. And one day I went for a run or I was um, doing a workout. And by the time I came home, I felt like a truck had run over me. And I have never been the same. And I have worsened to the point where um, I can barely leave my house. The amount of stories like that are incredible. And there's been a long, long standing um, history of damage for people with ME-CFS where you know, practitioners and health coaches and um, you know other people are telling us you just need to eat right and exercise. And if you do that consistently, you will be able to get better. And um, you know, you are not able to do these things because you're deconditioned. Um, and there is so much literature to the contrary, and there is so much evidence from patients. If you listen to the stories, you will realize that, you know, not wanting to do these things is not at all a factor. Um, and I would say all of us, um, because we want to be able to live our lives, to work, to be productive, to be able to enjoy outdoors and exercise. And um, it's not a matter of want to, but a matter of not being able to. Um, sleep disturbances that happened um, in these conditions are, are very prevalent, whether it is, you know, a diagnosed sleep disorder like narcolepsy, narcolepsy or um, severe insomnia. These are factors that are not able to be corrected with sleep hygiene, right? So there are other interventions and other things that need to be addressed first or at the same time in order to have any measured improvement when it comes to sleep and and then sleep itself or the lack thereof or the lack of quality of sleep also has an effect on other symptoms so it becomes a a vicious uh, cycle and then we have um food right eat right ancestral diets. We know that, um, you know, the quality of our food and the, um, the type of food that we eat has an impact on our health. But when you have a complex chronic condition, you're also dealing with food intolerances. And sometimes those are very severe and those modifications are, are not possible or, need to be done in a very careful, very st strategic, very layered approach in order to be able to work on the intolerances, the autoimmune reactions, the uh, dysbiosis in the microbiome while being able to, um, to hopefully reintroduce foods that we know are beneficial. So the approach 
is a lot more complex. It's not that we don't all have the the same biological needs, right? We all are humans and we are uh, potentially benefiting from um, instituting what we call the basics, right? We all need good nutrition. We all need movement. Uh, we all need good sleep. We all need community. Um, all of those things that are the pillars of ancestral health are also needed um, for everybody, whether you have a complex chronic illness or not. But in the process of a diseased body and where there is metabolic dysfunction, not just at a uh, regulation of, of, of calories in, calories out level, but a um, metabolic at the cellular level um, dysfunction where there is a lack of ability to convert those nutrients. There are so many factors that affect that um, those pathways that are not the same in one chronically ill person to another, which is why sometimes you make a modification or you take something and it has an effect, but many other times it doesn't. So we need to let go of the dogma that all medication is is harmful, right? Because we do live in the modern world and there are many things that have had a great impact um, in the quality of life and the ability to modify disease. So it is, it is not an either or approach. It is a both and an understanding that the complexity of these conditions are not just a, a do not get modified or do not see benefit from the simplistic approach of just do this or just do that or if you do this and that and don't see any results it is because you're not doing it hard enough or well enough or sufficiently enough we need to understand that although we do benefit in the terms of we all have the same biological needs, the approach to being able to implement these things and the level of quote unquote relief that they may have with people for complex chronic illnesses are not immediate uh, many times, are not sufficient many times and are detrimental in uh, many instances because other parts of the body are not functioning in a way that can withstand those introductions, those modifications, and those interventions. So if we understand each other, if we understand where we're coming from, we can not only have um, better communication and we can approach our individual situations with nuance, but more importantly, with compassion, then we can at least have the part of ancestral health that is incredibly important and that is going to get us to, um, to the next level, which is community. And that is what's being fragmented and it's being, um, dissolved by the way of dogma and by the way of lack of understanding of um, the different situations that we each face. Um, I encourage you to um, research more um, if you're a healthy person about long COVID and MECFS and um, the effect that those conditions are having on our population. And I encourage you to um, understand if somebody is telling you to that, you know, they have made these modifications and it hasn't made a difference in how they feel or how they function, that you um, understand that there is a deeper, more complex situation and on why that happens. Um, we need to be able to come together and we need to be able to, to know that although there 
are a lot of benefits to this lifestyle. There are also a lot of challenges for a lot of people. And um, by doing so, we can build community, we can um, be inclusive of each other, we can have productive conversations, and we can help each other thrive. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Ancestral Health Today. We hope you enjoyed our discussion on how evolutionary insights can inform modern health practices. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast to catch future episodes.